morning. I'd like to welcome our friends across District 8 and beyond. We're back tonight for another virtual D8 Youth Workshop today. Uh, my name is Terry Fender, your District 8 Director. Uh, we took about a week and a half off to let everyone rest up and recuperate, but we're back this evening. We're very lucky this evening to have one of our newer judges and one of our younger judges and as well as being one of, the, one of the top Angora breeders around here. I'd like to welcome the judge. Uh, I'm looking at a couple of things down here. I'd like to welcome uh, Rachel Pinnerman of Wisconsin to us this evening. She's going to talk on wool bre Angora breeds and wool evaluation. So she's going to have some nice things to show and some nice animals, and I'm sure we're going to uh, really enjoy this this evening. So uh, with that, take it away, Rachel. Sorry, I had to unmute myself. Hi, everyone. Um, just a quick introduction about myself. My name is Rachel Pentiman. I live in Wisconsin. I live in District 3. Um, I've had my Arbo license, judge's license, since May of 2019, so a little bit over a year. I raise French Angoras, Giant Angoras, and Satin Angoras. So three of the four breeds, I've never raised English Angoras, but I do have a lot of experience with them through other breeds, breeders. So I'm very happy to be here, very excited to present and educate you all a little bit about Angoras today. So without further ado, let's jump right into it. Um, so I am teaching about Angora breeds and wool structures and evaluations of the English, French, Giant, and Satin Angoras. So first we have the English Angora. They are known as the round ball of fluff. This is actually in the ARBA standard of perfection. They are described as appearing as a round ball of fluff. They are compact bodied. They are the smallest Angora breed. Um, total wool on these guys is 57 points, 25 points on density, 20 points on texture, and 12 points on length. Interesting fact is there's actually two extra points allotted to the English Angora length um, other than the other four Angora breeds. So length is actually worth a little bit more for the Angoras, um, the English Angoras. The wool is to be as dense as possible. And to feel density on the English Angoras, it's important to feel multiple parts of the body, not just one part. So don't just feel around the skirt. You wanna feel along the top, the saddle, blow into the chest, blow into the belly, especially look on the legs, underneath the tail. Wool should be even to the skin. If it's not, um, if you can't see the skin, that means that the wool is matted. Evenness and balance is very important for this breed. Um, it's very obvious when the wool is not even. The length will be distorted. It won't be even. It won't give it that clean, round, buff, round ball of fluff that we're looking for. The texture on the English Angoras is very important. It's to be soft, silky, and full of life. So they don't have as much guard hairs. The guard hair diameter is smaller on the English Angora breed and we'll get more into texture with the French Angoras. They're very different. And yeah, next slide. Okay, so these are obviously not my pictures. These are actually Betty Chu's pictures. Like all credit goes to her. On the left, we have a picture of the English Angora in full coat. This is a senior doe. She's a chocolate, she's just gorgeous. I love this picture. It really resonates that round ball of fluff appearance that you're looking for. You can see that the density and length is even all the way across the skirt, around the top line. You don't have that flat pancake appearance on this animal. Just a gorgeous coat full of life, even all the way throughout. And the right, we have a picture of crimp. I love this picture. You can see all that wavy crimp on the wool full of life, just beautiful crimp on that coat. And that's a picture of a chocolate tort. Gorgeous, gorgeous animal. All right, now we have the French Angora. 
They are known as the Queen Angora. And you might be thinking, well, Rachel, what do you mean by the Queen Angora? Does that mean that they, you know, lick themselves, make themselves cleaner? No, what I mean by the Queen Angora is that they have a clean head, clean ear, they don't have any furnishings, no fringes, they don't have any tufts. So they're very clean, they must be clean on the ears. Excessive head furnishings is a disqualification. They can't have wool past the ankle joints on the front legs, that is also a disqualification. They need to have normal fur on the head, ears, and front legs. The back legs can have um, wool. It is a fault, but it is acceptable on the rear legs only. They are shown in white and colored classifications for their showroom varieties. Um, the total wool is worth 55 points. So these guys have two less points than the English Angoras do on wool. There's 25 points on density, 20 points on texture, and 10 points on length. Again, density is worth the most points on the French Angora. You're gonna start to see a pattern with all the Angora breeds. Density is always the most important factor. It always has the most points for wool, for Angoras. Type is considered as oval, the side profile and the head. It says right in the standard that the head and the side profiles on these, when you're looking at them, it should be have a distinct oval appearance, not that round ball of fluff that we saw in the English Angora. When they're viewed from the top, they have an oblong shake. So they do have a little bit of tapering going on from the front to the rear. Again, the wool is to be as dense as possible. Not to be mistaken for mats, not to be mistaken for webbing. It's to be dense, full of life. Guard hair is to protrude over heavily, heavily crimped underwool. Guard hair is what protects the coat. It makes it mature correctly, and it can't have this unless we have heavily crimped underwool, full of life. It's to be very wavy, very balanced, and that guard hair is to protrude. If you don't have guard hair protruding over the underwool, the French Angora is going to have soft, cottony coats. It's not going to be correct for the breed, and that's a fault. For French Angoras, it's so important. I can't stress this enough. We're looking for balance, not the extremes. So what do I mean by that? We're not looking for a hairy coat for French Angoras. We're looking for that balance of crimp, which is the underwool, and the guard hairs. It should be half and half with the French Angoras. And with the French Angoras, it's so important. We need to make sure that we're describing the texture correctly. When you say this um, coat is too coarse, well, what is coarse? What do you mean? it's not very descriptive for the guard hairs. Is it a thicker guard hair? Is it a thinner guard hair? Is it unbalanced with the underwool and the guard hairs? You just need to be more specific. We're looking for a very balanced animal from the underwool, the crimp, to the guard hairs. All right, next slide. All right, and here's some satisfying French Angora texture. I love the picture on the left. You can see as the ra rabbit's being blown into with the grooming blower, you can see those guard hairs. They reflect excellently um, against the black vest. You can see them protruding over the underwool, just full of life, guard hairs, nice balanced animals. You can see that this coat is brought to life by the excellent crimp that's carried underneath. The coat cannot be held correctly if there's no crimp, because crimp is what's springing that coat. It's what's bringing it to life to have those guard hairs protrude. It has to be balanced. And again, on the right, we have another excellent example of French Angora guard hair. You can visibly see those guard hairs protruding over the undercoat. It's full of life, even from the skirt, the saddle, the top, and the chest excellent pictures of French Angoras. Oh no, okay, so here we have some faults. Um, on the left, it's not that this animal isn't in good condition, it's not that it hasn't been properly groomed. This rabbit just isn't completely finished yet, so we don't have that balance of undercoat compared to guard hair. This animal is very heavily 
it very heavily has guard hair. It doesn't have the crimp to support the abundance of guard hair that it carries. The middle, um, we have unevenness of density and length along the skirt and the saddle of this rabbit. It doesn't have that uh, density and evenness to be able to correctly balance out the texture as well. The guard hairs are broken up along the top and that's a fault as well because that's also going to distort your density. On the right, we have a picture of an animal that is in poor condition. It's in coat wise. It's the coat is starting to pack. It's starting to become a little bit webbed. And this is um, a good time to take the coat off, start shearing, start over. Because once you have mats in the coat, you just gotta start over. Phew, much better. Okay, so here we have much better examples of what the French Angora coat should embody. On the left, we have a beautiful example of chocolate agouti color. We have that visible wavy crimp, and we have the chocolate tipped guard hairs protruding over the undercoat. An excellent example. You can clearly see the intermediate bands of the ring, that bright orange color. Excellently groomed, good staple length. And I always say that crimp very much resembles the, tr um, the rings on a tree. You can always tell how that uh, coat has been treated from the very base to the middle to the guard hairs. It's just like the rings on a tree. You can tell how the animal has been treated from every stage of that coat. Kind of interesting. And you can see that through blowing into the coat. And on the right, we have a coat that's full of life, plenty of crimp to be able to lift up that coat. No pancakes there. It's an excellent coat full of life full of crimp, good protrusion of guard hairs. Exactly what we want to see on a French Cagora. All right, so next we have the giant Angora, also known as the commercial Angora. The giant Angoras were created for the purpose of being commercial animals, both body and their wool production. Obviously, they have commercial type. They are the largest of the accepted Angora breeds in the ARBA. They are shown as standard, and only currently the ruby-eyed whites are accepted for showing. They're currently working on the blacks. They have a COD for those and the chestnuts as well. Again, not to sound like a broken record, but we have the same points on wool for the giants as we did the French, so 55 points total. Density, 25 points. Texture, 20 points. And length, 10 points. The giant angora wool is to be ultra dense. Um, density is not to be confused for matted, webbed, or felted wool. Again, we're going to be blowing into the coat, seeing that it's full of life. It's even all the way to the skin. Um, it, again, it should be felted, blown into on the body, the nape of the neck, the sides, chest, belly, and legs. There's many sweet spots for mats on the giant angoras, and these are especially true in the um, locations that were just mentioned. And regarding sweet spots, there's no excuse for any Angora at any show to ever have a mat. So always make sure that you're blowing into the sweet spots and it's a fault. There's three textures for the giant Angoras. We have on fluff, on hair, and under wool. And you might be thinking to yourself, what the heck are those three textures? Well, the on fluff is at the intermediate texture. You're gonna find that in between your under wool and on hair. The on hair is just guard hair. It's another word for guard hair that we use to describe the giant angora coats. And the under wool is the crimp that you're gonna find at the base of the staple for the coat. So very special, they're very special breed. They have three textures and they're clearly designed, um, clearly stated in the standard of perfection. Yeah. <clears throat> All right, so here we have some more photos. Um, these ones are the giant angoras. The photo on the left is a picture of me blowing into the coat using a grooming blower. Again, it's parted all the way down to the skin. It's full of life. 
you can see the guard hairs, the on hair protruding over the underwool. Uh, the metal is a good representation of a coat full of life. This animal is correctly posed. And then the left, we have another example of a good giant angora. I love the face furnishings on this guy. He has heavy face furnishings as they should. Good tassels on the tips of those ears. Very pretty rabbits. <clears throat> All right, next we have the satin angora, known as the shiny angora. Again, the commercial type, they're to have medium length, not to be too long, not to be too short in body. They're shown in white and colored classifications for the showroom varieties. The total points for wool is 60 points on these. Guys, you will notice that um, they have the most points for wool of any of the angora breeds. And you might have been thinking, oh, well, I thought that was the English. Nope, they're the satins. And the reason why is that Sheen actually carries 15 points on these guys. Obviously, none of the other Angora breeds have Sheen, hence why they have 60 points. Satin Angoras will feel and appear less dense than the other breeds of Angora due to the smaller transparent hair shaft and finer texture of coat. That doesn't necessarily mean that they have less density or less um, amount of wool on them. It just, it will feel less dense because of that finer hair shaft. They have the softest and finest texture of all the Angora breeds. It's to be very soft, but they should still have visible guard hair. It's just not going to be as thick in diameter as, say, your French Angoras will have. But due to the sheen and the finer uh, density, it will feel much softer. The color is to appear more intense and brilliant due to the sheen. So because of the sheen, these guys, if you have a red, if you have a tort, they're just going to pop. And they definitely should. The sheen, it's very important that it's even all across the animal. They can't just have sheen on the head and ears. The sheen needs to be um, even across the wool, the body wool the legs, and the belly as well. All right, so this picture isn't the clearest picture, but I still like it though, because you can see the crimp on this rabbit. You can see that wavy underwool. Um, this animal has excellent sheen on both the coat and the head and ears. Very balanced animal. It is dense, the coat's full of life, it's supporting itself with the underwool. Good balanced animal with good height. So in conclusion, the wool breakdown for all four of the Angora breeds, the English wool is worth 57 points. French and Giant respectively are worth 55 points. And the satin wool is worth 60 points, making them have the most total wool of all of the four breeds. Uh, the wool point order of importance for all four breeds, it's uniform across, is always your density. Second is texture, and third is length. And then obviously we have the sheen for the satin angoras only. It's very important that density is your first consideration with the wool breakdown. You shouldn't just go straight to texture, it should always be density as the first consideration. English, French, and satins are shown in the white and colored classes, and then giants are shown as standard as of right now. Coarse, harsh, and other subjective texture words are not complete full descriptions for um, texture classifications. You need to be more specific. Is the diameter of the guard hair good? Is it missing guard hair along the saddle? Is it softer? It doesn't carry those guard hairs as well it could, or does it have excessive guard hairs over the underwall? It needs to be balanced, um, guard hair and underwall respectively. And you get one chance to grow out a good coat, make it count, because if you miss, especially with the English, if you miss grooming days and they haven't been groomed out in a week or two, you've kind of missed your chance because English Angoras, 
are a one and done coat for the most part. So it's important to pull out, coat out a good coat from start to finish. Again, it's like the rings of a tree. You can tell how the coat has been treated with every single month, week, and even day. All right, and that concludes my little presentation. So now I'm gonna pull out a couple rabbits and just show you guys how to evaluate them and what we're looking for. All right, so this is a French Angora. She's a junior doe. She's not even three months old. I think she's like two and a half. Um, she is a chestnut. So first thing I always do is I always evaluate the wool first because the breeder, the groomer has worked very hard to get that coat nice and prepped for the show table. So you always wanna evaluate the coat first. First, you're gonna lift up the wool, check your density flow into the coat. Again, make sure it's clean all the way down to the skin. There shouldn't be any webbing, no mats. Check for proper guard hair. They should be visible. This rabbit has very good protrusion of guard hair. It's nice and even, full of life, carries itself correctly. She doesn't want to behave. Um, you blow at the nape of the neck. That's a very easy sweet spot for uh, Matt. Flip them over. She's not going to want to flip over, but you flip them over, blow into the belly, blow on the chest, the rear legs. It should separate all the way down to the skin. Then you're going to go through and check the body of the rabbit. Make sure it has a nice strong shoulder, good midsection. Lift up the coat, check the hindquarter, because with angoras, you don't want to rake against that coat. You want to be making sure you lift up the coat, feel that lower hindquarter. Also, if you, the coat is in the low position, it can distort that hindquarter as well. All right. This is a giant Angora junior doe, same thing. Pose the same way, they're commercial type as well. Feel the body type. You should have a good full lower hind quarter. Blow into the coat, you're checking to make sure that it's proper density, full of life, it has the correct texture. Again, there's no excuse for any rabbit at any show to ever have a mat. Mats distort the overall condition of the rabbit. They can't properly grow out a coat with mats. And quite frankly, it's unhealthy for the animal. So we always wanna make sure that the coat is free of life, not to be uh, mistaking it for mats. It should be even all the way down to the skin. It's very important. She has good head furnishings, good ear tassels, especially for a junior. <laughs> She's cute. Giant Angoras, unlike the French, they should have wool on the front legs. The back rear legs should be properly furred as well. They should have excellent uh, wool, good substance on the rear legs. Check the vent, make sure there's no um, urine, feces. It should be clean, white, uniform throughout. So yeah, that pretty much wraps up my part of it. If you guys have any questions, please let me know. All right, Rachel, thank you. I mean, that was an awesome job, exactly what we was hoping to see, and I really appreciate that. Uh, if people want to uh, come in with some questions, uh, feel free. Uh, they'll be going in. Amanda at the Control Center will be seeing them, 
And please also chime in where you're at. You're from whatever town, state, feel free to chime in. It's always great to uh, know where you're at there. So, uh, Rachel, uh, I guess one question I was going to ask for somebody with the collared angoras. If you're not sure of the collar, do you look at the head or the body or what would you determine that by? Um, it should be uniform for the most part um, from the head and ears to the body. It might be a little bit faded with like longer length. You wanna make sure you blow into it, especially if it's like an agouti. The ring patterns described in the standard, it should correctly fit the standard and it should have the right under color. Always check the eye color on these guys. Make sure that they're the right eye color. Um, but it should definitely match from the head and the ears to the body. Again, it might be a slight change in shading, but it shouldn't be drastic. I, I learned it was my first show a couple of years ago when I was working for my registrar's license. Uh, it was uh, one of the old timers, Phil Macy, a wonderful man I was working under and I, the first time I touched an Angora, and uh, I missed an eye color that had two different eyes. And I tell oh, you, no. I learned from that. By gosh, every time I get him now, I check that eye color. Oh yeah, definitely check the eye color. Yeah, I'm like, man, I left a great impression on this man first time. It's uh, <laughs> I learned something right there. Uh, Amanda, do you have any questions coming in there from everybody? Um, I don't have any questions coming in right this moment, but we'll go ahead and do the shout outs from what states I see that we have here. It looks like we've got um, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Colorado, Delaware, Ontario. We've got um, some more Ohio, British Columbia. Um, do, 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 here. We have Virginia, North Carolina. And then some more Ohio's and Michigan's that have chimed in to say hello, that they are watching. Um, but currently at this time, oh, sorry, I got New Jersey that just popped on. Um, so, but at this time, I don't have any questions. Okay, well, Rachel, I think you covered uh, so much. I think you answered everybody's questions there. Uh, just like one of the other presentations we had, everything was covered and there's not many questions to ask, I think. Uh, uh, I really wanna thank you for joining us tonight, Rachel. Uh, we appreciate you giving us your time and uh, passing on all that knowledge and helping us learn more about the uh, wool breeds. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's a great opportunity for everyone across the nation to learn and it's a great job what you guys are doing with your educational opportunities. So thank you very much. Uh, well, thank you. Thank you for uh, taking your time today. Uh, I do uh, have just... a question. Okay. I'm trying to, all right. It says, is there any special things you need to do to take care or prepare a doe for kindling? For Angoras, it's the same as any other breed with exception to the wool. <laughs> so you just want to make sure that they're clipped down. They shouldn't have a big full coat on them. Um, for the sake of the doe and also for the sake of the kits, um, you don't want to get their neck strangled. You don't want to lose legs from getting it tangled in the wool. Just make sure they're clipped down. And you can put some wool in the box before they kindle, but Typically, they'll pull the wool on their own. So it's pretty much the same as any other breed, just exception with the wool. Make sure it's clipped down. Okay. Anything else, Amanda? I do. It says, um, what are the best supplements for preventing wool block? And she's sorry for tuning in late, so she may have missed it. All right, that's a great question. Um, what I use for wool block is hay. Your best bet is using hay, actually. Um, it gives them excellent fiber, keeps that digestive hind gut uh, moving throughout. Um, for supplements, I use oxygen. I use the, the regular oxygen and the immune eyes. I use those for supplements as well. And I've noted, um, 
the immune eyes especially definitely helps keep the digestive system normal, keeps it moving. Haven't really had any problems with digestive um, issues ever since I've started using wool block, uh, immune eyes for wool block. So, yeah. yeah. That was a good question. I like that one. Yes. Yeah. Uh, any others coming in, Amanda? Um, not at this time, but of course, right now on Facebook, they're um, getting the answer for the supplements. Okay. And I do want our viewers to know that Amanda is not really a talking camouflaged rabbit. That's not really Amanda. <laughs> uh, well, maybe I'll go over and cover a couple of points just in case any more questions come in. Uh, I wanted to say these workshops, you know, we started these and the uh, shows and live events, but now we've, uh, with the shows canceling, we've went virtual. Uh, these are mainly for our youth in District 8, but hey, we need to all work together. So no matter where you are at, across the ARBA or beyond, you're definitely welcome here and thanks for joining us. Uh, if you'd like to take a moment to check out maybe this video in its entirety, if you missed some of it, or if you want to check out our videos from previous uh, uh, virtual workshops or our live events last year, check out our District 8 YouTube channel, and that is called ARBA D8 Website. And you'll see a variety of videos there, and this one here tonight will be going up probably in the next day or two. I would like to announce a few more of our workshops. I almost mistakenly announced this next one here for tonight. That would have shocked everybody. Uh, coming up on June the 8th at 7 p.m., we have Judge Melissa McGee from California, and she's going to be talking on Himalayans and the role of climate control. And I think, you know, here in District 8, we don't see the Hemis like we used to. So I think this will really be interesting to everybody to get a chance to look at the Hemis plus the climate control for a Californian breeder like myself. You know, a lot of that affects the Hemis will go along with our Californians and some of the other pointed white breeds. So I think that'll be very beneficial. And again, that is June the 8th at 7 p.m. That was announced earlier, but I've got two more I'm gonna to announce tonight for the first time. I gave Rachel a little sneak peek ahead of time, so I'll give them to y'all now. Uh, coming up on June the 11th, and this is gonna be at 7.30. June the 11th at 7.30. We're going to be joined by Judge Jamie Green of Georgia, and he's going to talk proper care of your rabbit. You know, no matter how much we work and everything, if you don't take care of it, so Jamie's going to be here and talk about that proper care. Another one we've got coming up on June the 16th, and this is going to be at 7. June the 16th at 7 p.m., we're going to be joined by Judge Bryony Smith, and I still want to call her Bryony Barnes, excuse me, but Bryony Smith of Kansas, and she's going to talk on posing and handling. Uh, we covered this topic about a year ago in our, actually our original uh, live, our first workshop, but you know, I think posing and handling is something you can't cover enough of, so we're going to give that another in this year on the uh, virtual stage, we're going to say. So again, that's June the 16th at 7th, Bryony. So uh, those are our next ones. We've got some events scheduled up into July and we're gonna work on a few more and then we'll announce a few more probably next week. Right now we're only announcing about two or three in a row because of these strange circumstances that we're in now. You don't know what can happen. And you know, plus we wanna give a little suspense right there as well. So while well, I've been rambling on here, Amanda, do you have anything else come in? <laughs> Not this second. The reason that I'm laughing is because there might be somebody watching the video that's actually doing it. <laughs> Perhaps. <laughs> I want to see how many people are watching. <laughs> um, there was a question on here. But I asked if sometime if um, she could, if Rachel could do a video on uh, grooming. But she could probably see that question. <laughs> Oh, yeah. yeah, I did see that one. Um, I don't feel like it's really necessary to do a whole video of grooming. I can just talk about it right now. So what I do for grooming, I use my sucker brush as little as possible, honestly, with these guys, especially like the French. Because um, I've just learned from using the sucker brush, it just rips out the guard hair. So what I actually do is my show rabbits, the ones that I'm gonna show at the big one, uh, shows, I typically just use my grooming blower 
five to 10 minutes every day. Make sure you groom the saddles, uh, the skirt along the sides, and then especially make sure that you're blowing, um, that you're grooming the chest and the belly, rear legs as well when you're utilizing that grooming bar. So um, other grooming tools that I use, I use a plastic comb that I just bought at Walmart. It's a large plastic comb. I use that right before my rabbits go up on the show table um, just to finish out the coat, make it look prestige and prime, I guess you could say. Um, but yeah, for the rabbits that don't show, I'll typically groom them out once every two weeks. Um, just use the grooming blower on them. And yeah. That's pretty much all I do for, it's just very crucial for the show rabbits especially that you're grooming them out almost every day with the grooming blower. I can't stress that enough because every time you use that slicker brush, you're ripping into the coat, you're taking off guard hair, you're losing density. Whereas when you use the grooming blower, you're just opening up the coat, freshening the crimp, making it more cleaner, more healthier. But yeah, that's pretty much what I do for grooming. I don't really have any big secrets, any huge tips that I do. It's just grooming blower, uh, plastic comb, and occasionally I'll use the slicker brush um, to groom the uh, underside. I will use the slicker brush to groom the underside, like the belly and the legs, but that's pretty much all I use my slicker brush for. So Rachel, should I use the blower on these golden locks or do you? <laughs> yes, uh, you definitely I should. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I can't grow it like I used to. <laughs> Amanda, is there anything else there? Um, not at this time. All righty. Well, we're about close out right then. I want to say some thank yous. Uh, Rachel, thank you for joining us tonight. We really appreciate it. And thanks for all your time. Yeah, thanks for having me again. I appreciate it. Had you, fun. You, know, see, you may be asked again sometimes. So. Oh, boy. <laughs> all right. I'll be waiting. <laughs> Thank you. And I want to do, uh, thank my uh, District 8 web team, Amanda Behe, that's at the Control Center right now. Uh, she uh, not only runs the Control Center, she also works on some of the PowerPoints beforehand, and that takes a lot of time, and always usually a couple of days beforehand. She and I, along with her speaker, will get together just to walk through everything to make sure we have it straight. Then up in Michigan, I want to thank Jane Burt, in addition to her duties as webmaster and newsletter editor for D8. She puts out some really groovy flyers promoting these events. So Amanda and Jane, thank you. And I want to thank, of course, everybody who joined us tonight. Uh, you're the reason we're doing this. I hope these, uh, hope you all remain safe and healthy in these uh, interesting times. And uh, please remember to check back often to the ARBA website and Facebook page uh, as we make some uh, as the board uh, makes some actions and everything, uh, you'll be seeing some updates out there. And of course, we share those on the District 8 page as well. Uh, with that said, we hope we see you back on June the 8th to join us with Melissa McGee. In the meantime, stay safe and uh, thank you.